Welcome back, Legends. I hope you're all fantastic. Welcome to yet another installment of Monday Q&A. Thank you to everybody who submitted a question for this week's video and an extra special thank you to the people who support me over on Patreon. Next week's Q&A will be a patron exclusive Q&A. So if you're already a patron, please head over to the page and submit a question so I can answer it. You'll get early access to the Q&A video and then everybody else will be able to watch it next Monday. And if you like what I do here on the channel, you can support what I do from as little as a dollar a month. The link is in the video description. And as always, if you've got a question that you would like to submit on the next Q&A video, simply put it in the comments section below. I hope you've all had a fantastic weekend playing your guitars. Now we're going to talk about music, guitar gear, and a whole bunch of other things. But first, today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Soldano and the new Astro 20 amplifier, a three channel, four galaxy head made in the USA that combines all tube tone with features ideal for today's modern guitarist. Mike Soldano designed this sonic powerhouse to be a fully featured, versatile 20 watt amplifier that can also be used as a standalone cabless amp, ideal for live sound, rehearsal and recording in the studio thanks to the DSP-powered IR cabinet sims. Let's hear it. Check out the Astro using the link in the video description, and thank you again to Soldano for sponsoring this video. A bunch of you have noticed that I like to use my ring finger when I'm doing three note per string stuff. A lot of the time, say over my pinky, is there a particular reason for that? And do I have any tips or tricks? My general approach is, you know, say you're going to play fret 5, 7 and 8 on the high E string. That has always felt more comfortable to use my pointer finger, my middle and my ring. I've got pretty big hands and I can make that stretch fairly easily. What I like about that as well is it frees my pinky up if I do want to grab an extra note. So if I'm doing, say, a tone gap between notes, like say fret five, seven and nine, I would use my first, middle and pinky. If I was going five, six, eight, I'd do the same thing. But for those kind of tone followed by a semitone gaps, I'm always gonna use those. I've been doing it for so long. It's just a mechanical advantage. It's really comfortable. And I grew up watching players like Gary Moore and Gary does all his psycho pentatonic stuff with two fingers, which definitely helped early on. Also, I think it was either Sean Baxter or Jamie Humphreys in a guitar techniques column, amazing teachers, amazing players as well. Sort of mentioned when you're playing a pentatonic, why not just use your ring finger? You can probably make the stretch and your ring finger is a lot stronger in general. So that's probably like deep, deep in time for me, just baked in over there. I'm talking about this thing. Yes, that is a ragdoll song. It's called Letting Go. It's off our Back to Zero album. Again, I'm just going to absolutely shill it and tell you that you can buy the vinyl from our Bandcamp store linked in the video description, or you can just stream it here on my YouTube channel. The whole album is up there. I'll link it in the video description as well. If you like guitar noises, you might like what we're doing there. On the last Q&A video, we were talking about vintage gear that is overpriced, and I was asked about a few guitars in particular. One, when are we going to see some vintage Steinberger gear on the channel? I would absolutely love to demo some Steinberger gear on here. My very first electric guitar was a Hondo Laser, so a copy of an Erlewine Laser. If you're a Johnny Winter fan, you're probably familiar with the Laser. He played it a bunch live and there's an album cover, or at least one album cover, with a picture of him holding the Laser on there. So kind of Steinberger ish. I've never played a Steinberger with a Trans Tram. I think the Trans Tram has to be one of the coolest pieces of guitar hardware ever invented, right up there with the standard Fender Vibrato, the Bigsby and the Floyd Rose. You know, if you're an Alan Holdsworth fan, which I hope all of you are, some of the stuff Alan was doing with that. And then there's a bunch of other applications there where you can kind of use it like a moving capo. So look, if you're in Perth and you've got a vintage Steinberger with a Trans Tram, Hit me up, I make a mean cup of coffee and a not too bad cup of tea. Come over, play through some stuff and maybe I can make a video with it. I would love to do that. The next one was an Ernie Ball Music Man 
Axis. I mentioned Jamie Humphreys earlier in the video. I loved reading Jamie's columns in Guitar Techniques magazine. And Jamie does a lot of demo stuff on YouTube that you should check out. I think he's living in Sweden now. Perfect candidate to have on the gear podcast. Jamie or anyone who knows Jamie, if you're watching this, please hit me up. Would love to have a chat because you were very influential in my musical development. Reading all those old Guitar Techniques columns were fantastic. And Jamie used to play in Ernie Ball, Music Man, Axis all the time. I really like the sounds. I've got a PV Wolfgang. It's a special, but it's the one with the natural binding and the flat top, which I think were made in limited numbers. I'm going on tangents all over the place today. I was chatting to my buddy Jason Tong, and Jason has one just like that as well, which I think is pretty cool as well. You should go and subscribe to the Headfirst Amps channel as well, because you know, if you like vintage Marshalls and you like nerding out about amps, Jason is amazing. Nevertheless, can you believe it that I've never played an Ernie Ball Music Man Axis? I think they look fantastic. If it's anything like the Wolfgang, I'm sure it will be an awesome guitar. I think the Super Sport is more my speed. I'm not a massive Floyd Rose person, but you know, again, if you've got one and you're in Perth and you don't mind letting me borrow it and make some noise on it, I'd love to do a video with it and give you my thoughts. This segues perfectly into the main topic on today's video. Last week, I talked about vintage gear that is overpriced. What about modern gear that is overpriced? The first thing that comes to mind is everything is overpriced in Australia. And if there's Aussies watching this, you know how I feel. If you live in the US, you know, the gear industry kind of revolves around the US, except for Marshall. You know, Americans pay a little bit more for Marshalls. Maybe you could argue that Marshalls are overpriced in the US. I know they've just got a new distribution deal or something like that, and the prices have dropped. But compared to what you can get a Marshall in the UK or the EU for, you know, Americans pay a little bit more. And they whinge and whine about it a lot. But in Australia, we pay so much more for stuff in general. Get this, I looked up the list prices. A Boogie Mark 7 retails for like 34.99 US dollars. At the moment, that's about 5,400 Australian dollars. If you want to buy a Mark 7 in Australia, I've seen them listed new for eight and a half thousand Australian dollars. And look, I get it. Australia has import taxes and duties. They've got their own distributors that have to provide support for these products. You know, Australia is a long, long way away from uh, Petaluma in California, right? So just sending your amp back to the factory isn't exactly feasible. Uh, another example would be a Friedman BE in Australia. 6,000 Australian dollars, uh, Fractal Audio Axe FX3, the price works out being a lot more, again, because of those taxes, import duties, the geographical location. There's so many things that flow into that. On the flip side, though, Australia is such a livable place. We have universal healthcare. Wages are really high. You know, there's nowhere near as many people in quite a big space as well. The beaches are amazing. People are generally pretty friendly. There are so many other aspects to just living in Australia. That is great. I can kind of cop paying a little bit more for gear. So yeah, maybe it is overpriced, but maybe the lifestyle and everything else that goes with it kind of rubs against that. And actually we should stop complaining because we have it so good here in Australia. Having said that, some Stuff that I think is overpriced and just taking a look at it, you know, obviously the boogie thing, if you're in the EU, just trying to find a boogie at the moment, brand new is next to impossible. There's just not the distribution network happening. And, you know, that is another aspect of the last four or five years of the world being the way it is. But one thing that jumped out at me, Line 6 Pod Farm is one, still being sold. Two, it's $100. What is with that? That is ridiculous. I feel like they should just be giving that away as legacy software. I mean, the Helix gets free updates all the time. Uh, you know, if you've got a Helix, you can buy HX Native for like 50 bucks or something like that. But Podfarm, still listed for $100. That has to be the most overpriced piece of brand new gear out there. There's a few other prime examples on top of that. Anything audiophile adjacent, is just gonna be so overpriced. You know, you've seen those cables that are, you know, they're gold and they make your hi-fi system sound so much better. And, you know, it's just one of those things where suddenly the electrons flow in a way that electrons have never flowed before. Uh, chances are, if you're paying like $100 for a patch cable, 
you're just getting taken for a ride. It's absolute snake oil. Uh, on top of that, you know, for looking at guitars, things that maybe are a little bit overpriced. I mean, Custom Shop Gibsons, the prices have always been high. They just seem so much higher now. Even some of the expensive Epiphones I look at and kind of go, you know, why would you pay that for the Epiphone brand name? You've already decided you don't want to pay for a Gibson, so why not diversify yourself and look at all the other options out there? There are so many budget guitars now that are made so well. I'd love I'd love to see a big overview of the main factories that are making these things. It seems so opaque at the moment where, you know, you can get guitars that look eerily similar. They're clearly coming out of the same factory, but the brand name that they stick on them results in a massive price hike. I don't know if anyone knows anything about that, please let me know in the comments section below or can point me maybe to some handy videos that I can watch on YouTube tonight because I love diving deep into that kind of thing. But ultimately, especially with new things, right, there is a sliding scale where what are you looking for value-wise? Do you want something that kind of has humbuckers and sounds big and meaty? Or do you want a Les Paul? Like it's got to say Gibson and it's got to be a Les Paul and you're prepared to pay whatever for that. You know, there's slightly different value propositions. I'd love to know your thoughts in the comment section below about new gear that maybe you think is a bit overpriced. A few more questions to round out today's video. My thoughts on the ADA MP1 channel pedal. I have never tried one, but I do remember when they came out because I remember watching Brett Kingman's video with it. I just started watching a lot of YouTube demo videos and Brett is the OG. If you're not subscribed to Brett's channel and you are subscribed to my channel, what are you doing with your life? Brett is the best and practically wrote the book on how to do demos. And when I got started with my channel was a massive, massive supporter and someone who really helped me out a lot. Nevertheless, the MP1 channel, I went back and watched that video. I think it sounds really, really good. I do remember at the time you could get a used ADA MP1 for cheaper than the pedal, which is kind of what I did and one of the reasons that I have three sitting in my rack here. Ask me about that on the next Q&A. I digress. I kind of really want to try one out now. I have been struggling to actually find them for sale used. There's a few old reverb listings on there where the prices aren't too bad, but yeah, I just literally have not been able to find one. I've looked on Gumtree, eBay, Reverb, a bunch of other things. So if you can point me in the right direction, seeing as I've done so much stuff with old rack gear and ADAs, and I love the old ADA Depot forum. It's such a nice place on the internet. Shout out to the ADA Depot crew. I love all you guys. Thanks for all your help over the years, and especially for putting up with me as a 16, 17 year old asking the ultimate noob questions about this stuff, it would kind of be cool to do a video with the pedal because it just seemed like such a cool thing. ADA put a bunch of extra stuff out and it seems like they're not really making things anymore, which is a shame. And one last one for this week, my thoughts on digital fuzz. I think digital fuzz is still the final frontier when it comes to digital modeling. You know, if you think about how simple a fuzz pedal is and how sensitive it is to the way it interacts with your guitar pickups, your guitar electronics and your cable, as soon as you hit an AD converter and you have to buffer the signal, you're immediately excluding some of that behavior. So I think if you want super authentic fuzz behavior with a digital modeler, use a digital modeler, buy a fuzz pedal, put it in between your guitar and the modeler, and you will get that effect. That's just the easiest way to do it. There's so many great fuzzes out at the moment. We're living in the golden age of gear, but particularly the golden age of fuzz. Having said that, I really like the Source Audio Ultrawave and I really like the Eventide H90, uh, what do they call it, Aggravate they've just put out. They have another algorithm called Pitch Fuzz. I did a video with that last week and there's some amazing fuzz tones to be had in there. I also really, really like the Fractal Octave Distortion, which is an octave fuzz on there. I use that all the time when I'm trying to dial in stanky tones. And I do have a video with the octave fuzz, the ring modulator, and some envelope filtering coming up this week, which uh, you'll probably like if you like all those kind of things. That is it for this week's Q&A video this week. Again, next week's video is gonna be a patron exclusive q and I cannot wait to film that and put it up. It will be up the middle of this week for all the patrons and then up next Monday for everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning into this video. I massively appreciate everybody who 
has subscribed to the channel, everyone who's gone and checked out the music, all my amazing patrons, and to you for submitting questions and interacting. I feel like when I talk to my buddies who do YouTube, the people who leave comments on my videos are so genuine and just nice and well-behaved and respectful. It's the way we should be as people. So take it easy, be good to yourself, be good to everyone else out there. Go and make some awesome guitar noises this week and I'll see you on the next one. Thanks. <laughs>